Okay, great. So thanks for the intro, Cam. Um, in this uh, lecture, uh, 40 ish minutes, we're going to talk about uh, two things which are similar that they are um, using a 2D flow area behind uh, to model inside of a levee and then using a 2D flow area to model overbank areas. And um, the spoiler alert on this one is that uh, they're, they're, they're very similar. The, the basic difference comes down to is how you model the transition from the 1D to the 2D. And um, there's uh, a couple of choices you have to make and maybe some consideration on different, using different uh, coefficients like weir coefficients, but we'll, we'll come to that. Okay, so let's tackle the first one. So we want to think about what happens if you want to model this, the area that maybe traditionally was modeled with a storage area. Now we want to model with a 2D area. And we've talked to, we've seen some of these demos um, throughout the first couple of days of this like this class. But uh, the kind of steps here are, it's going to be a the kind of same kind of steps you would, would have done before, just it's got the 2D element instead of a um, storage area, if you're doing this with the new version with 2D versus how you would have done it in the past. Um, first thing, bring in the terrain. Um, get in background layers, whatever other um, extra GIS data you can help to get a handle on things. Uh, draw a polygon for the 2D flow area inside the levee. Um, and you could be drawing it by hand, you could be importing it from Excel, which is what uh, happens in our workshop here, or you could be importing it from a shapefile, which you can also do in, in our workshop coming up in the next hour. Um, you then go and complete the 2D area by giving it some uh, some computation points. Um, take a look at it, make sure there's no problems, and modify the mesh as needed, add brake lines for roads, high ground, and things like that. Um, mesh refinement regions, all those things we talked about for the first part of this, of this course. Uh, hook up the 2D flow area to the wonder reach. In, in this case, you're gonna use a lateral structure or many lateral structures. And um, think about the coefficients for what you're setting up. And basically what it comes down to for the weir coefficients is um, if the structure ends up behaving like a weir, like is there a really big water source elevation between the riverside and the and the protected side initially, then the weir coefficient might be a better way to think about it. And um, later when we talk about the other case where we're modeling overbanks, it's not really a weir, so maybe weir coefficient is not the most appropriate, but we'll, we'll see that. Um, if you're going to model breach, then you would model, uh, bad news is it's complicated, the good news is it's the same if you had done it in with just 1D before. Um, and then we'll look at some uh, some coefficients that might be appropriate for this type of modeling. So this is the uh, St. Paul data set that we think we looked at on the first day, maybe, maybe a couple of times. So you could go in and start with the terrain, um, have a 1D system that's got your river line and all your cross sections there all set up. Then um, draw that boundary for the polygon, uh, get a spacing for the 2D cells, and you're off, you're off and running. Uh, go into the 2D flow editor, put in that uh, DX or DY, uh, hit the generate points. Um, if you're pasting in the perimeter, then you would uh, put in the table values with the little icon right there. Um, once you've made a mesh, then you get your, your stats on there, like number of cells and um, average size of the cells. You can set a background default end value, and the one that in the VB6 or the old part of the code, that's what the 2D flow editor looks like this. The one in RAS Mapper looks similar. Um, but then you have your you have your mesh, and you could call that good and start running it. <clears throat> but some other you know striking features right there are maybe we would want to go in and put in some brake lines because it looks like there might be an area. Where, the structure right here looks like a freeway on ramp or something. It looks like it would actually hold the water back. So those are kind of things for you to go and refine your model with. Okay, so now that you've got it all set up, what would happen if you ran it? Well, nothing would flow into the 2D area. It would remain completely dry the whole time because we need to have either some flow into it or we need to have some connectivity and do something else that's got water flowing into it. Um, and in this case, we're going to use a ladder weir. And the way you put in ladder weir is the same way you would put a in as you would have done in any of the other uh, 1D models that you have, might have made earlier. You, know, you can get it to work not having it geospatially referenced, but it, it is substantially way better to, to do that. <clears throat> um, and we'll, you can do that either in RAS Mapper by drawing the center line for the lateral structure, or you could uh, do it over in the VB6 side or in the old RAS interface side and um, draw it there or paste in the coordinates in one of the tables in the lateral structure editor. So 
you open up lateral structure editor and um, under options you can add a new lateral structure give it its pick pick a river retriever station and the river station has to be between two cross sections that you're going to be take, you're going to be starting from it can't be one of the number can't be exactly the same as one of the cross sections because they have to be unique um, then you could uh, paste in the centerline coordinates here if you have not already generated another way so that's the that uh, button down here over on the right um, there there's two other fields which you might not have paid attention to before but they're pretty important when we're doing this kind of connection in 2d is that the computed centerline length it tells you right here so it's just the the plan view uh, length needs to be really close like I would try to make them exactly the same so if, um, for the profile so this line right here or this number right here this is going to be when you go and put anywhere embankment um, this is going to be the length, so the first station minus the last station, or last station minus first station. That's going to be that, that, that length right there. It doesn't have to start at zero, but it's easier if it does start at zero when you put in your profile. Um, other things are the tailwater connection. Um, when you pick, uh, I want it to flow to a, uh, you could do what the, the same options there were before, but instead of saying storage area, it's now I got a storage area slash 2D flow area. Um, and when you can pick this button right here to go and pick which one. And um, the only other thing that is new, well, I guess there's, well, on this editor, the next new thing is the section right here. It says overflow computation method. And you could use either the Weir equation, which is what we would have done in all cases prior to now. Um, but now that we have the 2D methodology, you can say, I want to actually compute the flow over the structure using the normal 2D flow equations. And uh so which, which is more applicable um when water's flowing over from over high ground and dropping a long ways over a significant size levy then the weir equation is a better pro it's a better uh, model for that situation um in the case where you end up where the water surface in the channel is going to be really close to what it is it's a highly submerged situation so you're mostly just taking water out of the channel and going into the overbank um then you might want to use the 2d equation for to do that and further, if you're using 2D equation, would you like to inject the velocity um, as as energy into the 2D area? And you can turn that on that, off of that checkbox. Um, okay, so I guess we got another view guide there. So letting you know that you really should make to make it's important to have these numbers really close together because we're going to go to this center line and we're going to distribute the we're going to distribute the elevation of the weir line along that 2D center line. Um, if you pick the coordinates center, then this is the dialogue you would get and you can go paste them in there or just see what they look like. If you wanted to override it with a train profile, you could push that button right there um, and then you could adjust it however you wanted to. Um, so additional lines in here is after you've run the model once, then, um, or at least you have pre-computed the tables that we talked about for the last few days for the, the structure, um, there's another line here. It says a uh, tailwater cell minimum elevation. So that that is this black line right here, which is this line right here in this plot. And there is a rule for flow going into and out of um, 1D areas into 2D areas. And that rule is uh, the elevation at which you're putting it in cannot be lower than the cell minimum elevation. So you can't have a, a cell that's perched up here and say, well, I'm going to try to put water in down here. And that uh, the program will let you do it. Um, somewhere along the way, it'll say, oh, we're not gonna allow this. You need to go back and look at it. Um, and one way you can see that is on this plot right here where we can see that the weird line, which is this line right here, is all above this line right here. So then we would see that we're comfortably not pushing water into um, below the, the minimum cell elevations in the 2D area. Okay, so if you go to the weir editor, um, this is just a regular weir editor. You put it in like you would any other case where you're doing it in 1D, you're putting in the station elevation data. So the width of this thing would be 671.42 minus zero. So it's 671.42 feet long. Um, I think it's a lot easier to have the stationing on the weir start at zero, but, it, but you do not have to do that. Um, some new things are, are relatively new, are is this headwater connection and tailwater connections. So the headwater connection, this tells you that along that weir line, so the weir stationing, went from, uh, let me back up one slide here, it's going from zero to 671. So from zero to 671, um, this is saying that there's, a, between these two points right here, there's the two, there, there's, there are these two cross sections. So 
the flow that started in zero will end up being like proportionally mostly near this this cross section or let's see let's back up two and think about it uh, right here um here's those three cross sections that we're looking at and here's the weir line so the stationing along the weir starts at zero but it's saying if you were to think about the context of what stationing would this cross section see it's a it's a negative number so what, what that would be saying is that from here to here there's going to be no weir flow but from here to here um, is going to be that section of the weir is dedicated going into these two cross sections. The stationing between here and here, whatever flows over the weir is going to come into or out of these two cross sections. And that's, what, that's really what we're trying to solve and show you with the connectivity table is what part of that weir is going to go between what part of this, those two elements. So, and then this station down to this station of the weir, the full weir, that's going to go all into uh, the computations of an inflow or outflow subtracted from or added to the 1D domain between these two cross sections, between that one and that one. Okay, so that is the connectivity on this side, on the river side. On the other side, on the 2D domain, it's the same problem, but we're instead of thinking about between two cross sections, we're thinking about into a cell. So in this case, the weir line from here to here is gonna flow into this cell. The weir line from here down to here is gonna flow into this cell. And the weir line from here to here is going to flow in here and so forth. That from here all the way down to here is going to be mapped to the cell. And then the weir from here to here is mapped to the cell. And what, the, in, in what happens in the computations is we look at those two mappings and we break it down into the most common smallest element where it's just going from one thing to another. So in this case, we would be going from from here to here would go from this 2D, from this these two cross sections to this 2D area, this 2D cell, and then from here to here would be going from this cell, or this two, this between these two cross sections into this cell, and then from here to here would be going from this cell to this these two cross sections, and so on. Um, and that is all reflected in in these two tables where we're looking at the headwater connection and the tailwater connection. So the headwater connection is showing weir stationing versus cross sections. And the tailwater, in this case, is showing weir stationing versus um, 2D face points. And if you turn on the 2D face points, then you can see those numbers and you could, you could see how all those fractions and ratios turn out to be. <clears throat> okay, so you can, it has a default, and you could um, copy that over there and then change it if you wanted to. But I would encourage you not to do that. Um, so if you wanted to do that, if you didn't like the way the automatic hookup worked out, um, you could say, I know, I know better, and click it here, and then override that data. But I would encourage you to go and massage your GIS data until it works out, until the automatic connectivity works out the way you want it to, rather than overriding it. One of the hazards of overriding it is when you override it, you say, I know that I want to connect weir station whatever to, um, to this 2D uh, face point. And that, that you can set that all up, and it does work. But the problem is if you go remake your mesh or add some points or delete them, then the numbering all this changes and then that's not good anymore. So I would encourage you not to do that. I would encourage you to edit the GIS data rather than spend any effort on overriding the connectivity that's automatically computed. Okay, so there's where those face points are turned on. And so we're going from face point 460 to 414. Um, that's along this face right here, and, and it's going to get this fraction of the cell, and then face point 414 to, 4, to 373 is going to take this range of that um, of that profile. Um, other things of note on this plot are, you see this red line right here? might be hard to see on, on the display right here, but if you have a ladder, if you have a, um, a breach set up, this is one way you can see that that's, that's where it's at. So when you put in the breach, you're looking at it in, in profile, um, but this is the way you can, where you can see that's where that's going to end up when you're in plan view. What about the the coefficients that are appropriate uh, that we're going to use to describe the flow from the 1D domain into the 2D domain? And if you're going to use a weir equation, then there, there's this table. But there's basically like two parts to this table. The top part is where it's really like a weir, and the bottom part is it's really not like a weir. Um, and that is reflected on the range of coefficients. So if it is really like a weir that there is um, a significant difference in elevation between the upstream and or between the river side and the the um, the protected side, then you're going to use a coefficient like around two or something, at 1.5 to 2.6. 
Um, and then as it gets to the point where there's not much of a, a DECA roadway, not much of an embankment, then you can use something closer to one. And then in the case where we're going to try to model over, when we're modeling overbanks, we're going to we're going to find that we're going to be looking at more of the bottom part of this table. Okay, so if you think about weir coefficients, one of the things right at the top is like, oh wow, the 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 big weir coefficient here. Um, when I have a big levy, hmm, they're kind of low. When we think about inline structures, we usually would think about like you know three or something like that would be a a, a decent weir coefficient. But but in that case, the momentum of the channel is all flowing straight down the river, and then you have a structure and it goes over that. And in the case of the lateral structure. The momentum is still going down in the 1D domain, um, but that, that momentum that is available in the downstream longitudinal direction is not helping it flow over the side. And we reflect that uh, pro that difference with our weir coefficient being a little bit um, smaller from the default. Okay, so once you've got a lot of weir in, hooked up and uh, connected and passing water from one domain to another, what else can we do? We can, uh, we can breach that structure. Um, when you have a, the situation we're looking at there on the, um, uh, the St. Paul, uh, you might have noticed that the St. Paul, the whole city right there, we were just using a lateral structure over just, just part of it. And that's all we were tinker, tinkering with right now. And one of the reasons you might want to do that is there's a limitation in RAS that each lateral structure can only have one breach on it. And, um, that is one reason why you might want to have several lateral structures along the, along your, um, embankment while on your levee so that you could um, have a potential breach set up in multiple places and then maybe just one of them will trigger maybe all, they'll all trigger maybe they'll all fail um, but that is one of the one of the limitations in how we have breaches set up kind of changes how you lay out your ladder weir on the input side just in the geometry we try not to have too many of those limitations but there are some and this is one of them um, other things to note, if you're just getting back at doing breaching, if you've forgotten about this for a while, there is a big checkbox right up here that says breach the structure. Um, putting in the, the information for a breach, there's a fair bit of data. This is just one. There's a couple tabs here and some other modes and could be a fair bit of effort to get that set up. Um, and if you decide you didn't want to breach that, then it's nice not to have to delete that. So we have this checkbox up right here where you can put in data, keep it, and then say, yeah, for this simulation, don't don't breach it. So if you if you think everything hooked up and you're running it and you think it should be breaching, but it's not happening, like it seems like the water's over the elevation and it should have actually triggered, then you could uh, make sure you have that turned on. Okay, so the default mode is this uh, basic mode. This is what we've had for a long time. Um, and a few years ago, we had this other approach called uh, simplified physical breaching. And if you go into that mode, you get a couple other options down here. The basic idea is that uh, there's another tab here called Simplified Physical, and I'm going to jump to the next slide. Well, I guess the the first thing is we talk about instead of being a total width, so let me back up one slide, when we say we know the final bottom width and the final bottom, final bottom elevation, once the tr breach process has started, no more, um, it, will, it will grow to this size. Um, it doesn't matter if there's no more flow or anything like that. Once it starts, it's going to take that breach, uh, the breach formation time, and of one hour. And over the course of one hour, it's going to grow to 100 feet wide and with a final bottom elevation of 704 feet. Um, even if there's no more water in the system, it will continue to grow because it's just it's just a trigger. Once it starts, it happens. Um, a a more physical-based approach would be like noting that it takes a velocity difference or a head difference with a velocity going through the opening for the breach to actually grow. And that's that's basically what this methodology was set up to do. So instead of saying, I know what the, top, the, the bottom and width and elevation are going to be, you're saying it could get to be this big. And further, it's going to grow according to the relationships we're going to put in right over here. So let's jump to that. Um, so there's this, these, these tables where you can put in that if the velocity is this is, goes from zero to 20 feet per second, then it will downcut according to this rate. And um, it'll widen according to this relationship. Um, in this case, we have the same velocity elevation uh, numbers here and there, but you don't have to. They could be their own relationship. Um, there is another option down here. It says mass wasting, mass wasting feature, and it's optional. But if you use this methodology with a simplified physical breach, 
Um, what would actually have to happen is you would have to have water um, go over the levee, get a subsizable enough velocity over it, then you could start down cutting and start widening. But a lot of times that's not really the way levees fail. Normally, or often, there's just like a, a plug that kind of all just kind of disappears at once. That uh, you would achieve some trigger of some kind and then like a, a chunk just kind of falls off and then you get a substantial area, a substantial velocity, and then these relationships here will take over. So um, that's what the mass wasting feature is and it's new with simplified physical breaching. Um, you specify a width and a um, elevation of that plug and how long it's going to take to just kind of plop out after the trigger is met. Um, and then that will provide the initial uh, tube for which flow will fl the, the, the drain for water moving from the 1D section to the 2D section. And it'll have a velocity, then it'll start following these relationships and grow accordingly. Um, submergence issue. So, we talk about this in every one of our classes because it's a big deal and it's a, it's a, a source of instability. And um, it is nothing special about how we, this problem happens in 2D. And it might, it might actually be more stable in the 2D approach than with our finite difference 1D, but it's still the same problem and we have the same solution. And that is uh, what happens when the water surface elevation with a weir with weir flow computation starts to get um, starts to get highly submerged. So the water surface on the tailwater side starts to get similar to the upstream side. Um, then the weir equation does not do a very good job of reducing the amount of flow that actually happens in, in that region. So a weir is in, it's very accurate and very good to model it when there's a, when there's um, even up to 95%. So only a 5% difference in water surface elevation from upstream to downstream. It doesn't really affect the flow very much. It doesn't because um, if you think about it going, there's kind of a critical depth concept in there that when it's water's going through critical depth, that doesn't really matter how much the, the if you have your upstream and tailwater, it can get pretty close before it matters at all of what's happening on the upstream side. So um, the equations are set up for that. And there is something in, in called uh, submergence reduction factor. And it looks like this curve right here. So the top curve says normal curve, and that is this one, the, the dark blue one with diamonds. And this is the one that is programmed in and used in the uh, computations by default. Um, and what this is saying is something like at uh, point at 90% submerged, it's only gonna reduce the flow by, that's still like 95% at, at submerged. Let's see, we follow that line, then it would still be around 80% the same, um, same flow as if it was you know, falling off of a cliff. So we can get within 5% before we, it drops 20% in, in flow. And other things you might notice about this, the shape of this curve is that as it starts to get submerged, this thing right here gets steeper, steeper, steeper until it's pretty much vertical down here. And um, that is kind of the recipe for model instability. So you're saying that as something happens, uh, which is kind of gradual, that the water surfaces start to get closer and closer together, then we're gonna do something fairly dramatic. We're gonna start making a, a very large change to our, um, our coefficient and that can cause instability. So what do we do about that? Uh, I think this was developed by Dr. Barkow years ago. So he noticed um, and he, he was ahead of his time in terms of understanding um, what slows down computations and what doesn't. And um, he, uh, noticed or developed the idea, actually I'm not sure it came from him, but that's where I, that's how I know it from, is that you, you can take that coefficient, which is always a number less than one, and if I just raise it to an exponent that the user can, has control over, like if they put in an exponent factor of three, it'll make it substantially smaller. So if, uh, if I had a 95% submergence and I took whatever number that was, like 0.75 or something, and then raise it to power three, then I get a, a smaller number. So what, the, what that ended up doing was you would put in one number and it would change the shape of this curve. So this curve, basically same form, it doesn't change much, much until you get above 85%. Uh, but what it really does and why it makes the computations more stable is it flattens out this curve portion down here. So instead of, instead of going here and then getting really steep, it's more gradual. So this will reduce the weir flow um, by, the, by altering the weir flow submergence reduction factor and um, make your model more stable. So the default is don't do any of this. 
But if you start to get instability around um, weirs, particularly when they start to get close to have the same elevation on the upstream and downstream side, then you, this is one thing you can go look at doing. So where do you actually go put that in? And that is on the um, unsteady computation options and tolerances dialog on the first tab. Um, over here on the right says a weir flow submergence decay exponent and it's one to three. So if you have a coefficient and you raise it to the power of one, what does that do? Nothing. So um, the default is one and if you can, if you, you can put it to two and up to three. <clears throat> or it doesn't even have to be an integer, you could put it, uh, fractional exponents as well. Um, other things, very much like all the other models we talked about, you need to associate the terrain with the geometry. Um, compute the hydraulic tables, and you could do that here by right-clicking on the 2D flow area, and one of the many options is compute the proper tables right now. And if you do that, that will be done um, on the, the thread of the, um, uh, the RAS is running on. So you won't be able to do anything else in RAS while that's chunking through. Um, if you go and hit run and just turn on the geometric preprocessor, then it'll then it'll run on another, another process and you could still continue to use RAS and, um, and adjust more of your input if you wanted to. Um, or if you did, if you just disregard it entirely, then uh, RAS will note the time at which they were last computed versus the time at which you've made any changes to the geometry and then uh, recompute them accordingly. Okay, so here's that um, example of the uh, of the levy failing. So that breach happened right over here, and we see that it was confined by a bunch of different little things through here, and it ended up flooding this way and kind of backfilling coming around this direction. Uh, that's the kind of thing that kind of would have been hard to figure out. Once you a lot of a lot of insights you get in developing out of a two D model, they end up you think, oh yeah, if I had like saw how that was all going to happen. Once you see that it was going to happen then you think, oh yeah, that's how it should have happened. But ahead of time, it can be really hard to figure out what, what is gonna happen, where which direction the water is gonna go. So, you know, one of the great things about 2D modeling is it helps you figure that out. You don't have to guess and, and get it right with having a, any way to check that. Uh, the output that we look at for regular lateral structures, um, this is an old view, our new plot um, looks nicer than this, but it's the same data. And you can see the um, uh, headwater, tailwater, the two, uh, all the stages are blue and they're on the left axis and all the flows are on the right. Um, with this old plot and with our new one, you can, if you're wondering which line is which, you can just click on the dialogue over here or in the, on the, in the legend and then it'll make it a magenta or something and it'll show you which, li which line that is over there. And our new, new plot has got kind of a moving bobber uh, option. So as you move your mouse across it, it'll show you the elevations wherever it intersects uh, with a vertical line. It's, it's, it's pretty cool. It's new tools, really fun. Um, the tabular output from before you could get and um, uh, see how much flow is going over different parts, see what the coefficients were and things like that. If there's a breach, how much, what was the average velocity in the breach, how much area, how, how wide was it at this time step and so forth. <clears throat> Um, within RAS Mapper, there's a handful of the tools that we talked about this morning and earlier, uh, particularly that Alex went over, is that you could uh, click and get unsteady timeshare spots of whatever you have turned on, like depth, um, velocity, and <clears throat> okay, so that is the guidance for, or that's a opening offer for things to consider and a plan and approach for how to go to model um, a protected area behind a levy with a 2D flow option. Um, so now we're gonna talk about something which uh, kind of conceptually is different, but in practice, um, most of it's the same. That we wanna model, we, we wanna just model the channel with 1D and we wanna model the overbanks with 2D. Um, and we're look at, we'll look at the, the terrain here in a second where the overbanks are fairly complicated, but the channel, very much just a regular channel and 1D seems like a decent approximation to that. Um, so we're going to go over the steps where you draw a polygon, create the mesh, view the mesh, modify the mesh, hook it up. Um, think about that overall computation method. And this is where we're going to really get the differences between what we were doing with um, going over levy versus just kind of going from in, in channel to out of, out, out of channel. And how that affects the weir coefficients and, and what, what, what you might do with submergence issues. And, and they're similar, but there is really one to one one choice you might make that uh, is substantially different, and that's picking to use the one D equations. Excuse, excuse me, to use the two D equations rather than the, the weir equation in this case. So here's.
here's a DEM. Um, there are some, I think that these are really gravel pits that are actually really deep, but there's a channel that goes down through here. Um, and then a, these are actually buildings inside the, the detailed terrain model. So we, we're gonna see the water go around the buildings. Um, we will, it doesn't go into them, so we won't have any volume in there, um, but, it, but there will be an obstruction to the flow. Um, here's the uh, contours. I think Alex mentioned earlier that the contours work really well. And uh, when you're worried about trying to f understand um, which way the slopes are going, you can draw lines and cut profiles. But turning on on the contours can be can be really helpful too. To keep that keep that in your your your, your toolbox. Okay, so here we have it set up where we have a, um, a polygon. We have a 2D flow area out here. We've got one in the middle up over here and then a, a third one down over here. And um, we've made no particular attempt to line up the, the mesh around the buildings. I guess you could, um, we have not done that. Did not think that was significant for what we were trying to achieve with our model here. When you set up those uh, ladder weirs, let me back up one here. Uh, we're look, we're going to consider. Actually, I'm not sure which weir this is. It doesn't really matter. But in this particular case, seeing as how we're modeling that that uh, that these two areas are not um, there's not a weir really between. It's just kind of the open ground that when the water go went out of channel, then we're, it ended up in the 2D area. So in that case, it, it seems like a good idea to use the normal 2D equation domain rather than a weir equation because it's not really a weir. <clears throat> Um, if you did use the weir, then it would matter which uh, weir coefficients you selected. So if you had selected this other option, use the weir equation, um, then you'd be looking at what using one of these weir coefficients, which is somewhere between 0.2 and 1. Um, it doesn't, if, let me back up one slide. If we had used this option, like we have selected here, then the weir, whatever coefficient you put in here doesn't matter at all. It doesn't, it doesn't use it, it uses a different a different computation method, not in uh, the submergence stuff that we would be worried about um, are, is not applicable at all. Um, the, the 2D methodology does much, much better when the water surfaces are somewhat close together, does not do particularly well when it's at, like the classic weir situation. Um, anyways, that is what I wanted to talk about.